Good afternoon, everyone. Today we'll have our updated data and modeling presentation. Secretary French will give an update on schools. Secretary Samuelson will discuss hospitals, testing, and vaccinations. And Dr. Levine will round us off with a health update. First, as we continue to keep a close eye on the data, and you'll see in Commissioner Pichek's presentation that trends in our region are encouraging. But just like everything else with this virus, there are no guarantees. The good news is Vermonters continue to step up to get boosted, so they're up to date and it's making a real difference. As we lead the nation in vaccination and booster rates, we also have the lowest hospitalization rates. For context, if our hospitalization rate matched the national average, we'd have over 250 people in the hospital with COVID today. If we had New York or Nevada's rate, it would be in the 300s. But I want to be clear, our hospitals are still facing stress. And I share this data only to emphasize how important it is to get vaccinated and boosted. Staying up to date protects you from severe illness and keeps people out of the hospital. And even though we lead the country, there's still about 200,000 Vermonters who are eligible for a booster but haven't received one. According to the CDC, over 95% of Vermonters over five have begun vaccination, and that number continues to grow. But as well as we've done, we still need to keep working to push this number up. There's no doubt Omicron has caused disruption and stress for hospitals, schools, and businesses. So as we keep moving forward, Vermonters can help themselves and each other by doing the things we talked about for months. Get vaccinated and stay up to date. Stay home when sick. Use testing as a tool and wear a mask in crowded indoor settings. These common sense approaches work and they'll keep us heading in the right direction. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pita. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Good afternoon, everybody. So taking a look at our presentation this week, we start with just a look across the United States map. Uh, cases in the country have not yet seen this clear and steady decline that we're seeing here in the Northeast. Uh, but as you can see from the map, a very broad improvement across uh, much of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. Parts of the country that were hit first with Omicron uh, had the uh, experience most significantly right before the holidays, during the holidays, and after the holidays. Uh, but still other parts of the country are seeing their cases uh, either continue to rise or not yet plateau. But fortunately, as the governor said, we are seeing that improvement uh, here in the Northeast. In New England in particular, cases are down 18% over the last week, down 45% over the last two weeks. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see Vermont overlaid with all of the Northeast states. You can see that the other states in the region uh, did see Omicron, uh, an impact from Omicron earlier than Vermont. Uh, and for the most part, for all of those states, the impact was also more significant in terms of their case counts on a per capita basis uh, got higher than Vermont, and they saw more case counts than Vermont. So a few of those states, like um, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut, their cases have been coming down around 50 to 60 percent since their peak. Vermont, we're down about 30 to 40 percent. Uh, so that's really good improvement, but we're a little bit behind, maybe by a week or 10 days, some of these other states that saw a much um, more significant and early impact from Omicron. So getting to Vermont's cases, you'll see that our seven-day average is just over 1,100, 1,121 cases. Uh, again, down 27 percent over the last seven days, uh, down 37 percent over the last two weeks. So again, some really good news here in terms of the trend that we're seeing. Uh, but then again, a reminder that our cases continue to be averaging over 1,000 a day. Uh, so we want to continue to see those trends uh, go down and want to see some uh, much continued improvement uh, before we are comfortable that uh, things are uh, significantly different than they are at the moment. You'll see that, that testing has come down over the last week or so, down about uh, you know 17%. But again, our cases are down more significantly than that, down about 
uh, 27 percent. So the case reduction that we're seeing in Vermont, not an artifact of simply a reduction in uh, testing, uh, does appear to be a real decrease, and there's other metrics to support that as well. Looking at higher education, you'll see uh, one of those examples. We had fewer cases on campus this week, although over 300 cases, uh, but that was when colleges were doing significantly more testing as well, about 2,500 more tests this week uh, compared to last. So more testing this week on college campuses, uh, but fewer uh, cases identified. So uh, one example of uh, certainly improvement. One place where we haven't seen that improvement yet is in long-term care facilities. So there are 25 active outbreaks in long-term care facilities. The uh, chart that we show here is showing the facilities that have uh, cases identified. There's about 10 that are not on this chart uh, where the number of cases are not shown, but in total it's 25 outbreaks and 325 active cases associated with those outbreaks. And I think Dr. Levine will have a little bit more information on that. So turning to the next slide, you'll see this is the uh, forecast page. So again, we anticipate that this trend will continue, that we will see cases come down uh, in Vermont over the next two to three weeks, that through the end of February, hopefully they'll get to a much lower place than they are today, um, which is certainly uh, very good news. The, the trend down is occurring more quickly than we thought it would. We thought we'd start to see this at the end of January. You know, we've been seeing it now for about 14 days. Uh, so confident that the trend is moving in the right direction. But again, cases are still high relative to what we were experiencing prior to Omicron. The other thing that we'll keep a close eye on is some of these international jurisdictions that saw a really significant Omicron uh, peak and then decrease, uh, in particular the UK, Canada, and, uh, and South Africa. So in all of those cases, they have seen their COVID-19 positive rate start to slow down in terms of the decrease in recent days. Uh, so we want to see if they're going to plateau out at a certain point or if they're going to continue to see their cases drop to a very low level. That's what we'd hope to see, uh, but want to keep a close eye on that. And for the moment, at least in a couple of these jurisdictions, it does seem like their cases are plateauing out maybe at a little bit higher level than they want to see. So again, just another word of caution uh, as we look to these improved trends in the Northeast and in Vermont. Looking at our statewide hospital numbers, you can see that uh, up about 7%. So this is uh, just starting to see some slowdown in our hospital figures overall. Uh, we're still reporting over 100 people in the hospital and have been for about 11 days. But we do anticipate starting to see hospitalizations come down over the next week and continue to come down uh, as uh, fewer cases are reported in Vermont. Uh, so that means that there are fewer people going to the hospital that need to be treated for COVID. But because there'll be less cases circulating, there'll also be fewer people who are admitted to the hospital for other reasons who happen to test positive while there. So as cases come down, we should see those hospitalization numbers come down for both of those reasons. On the ICU side, we are already starting to see some improvement. Uh, the ICU numbers are down about 4% over the last week. Uh, and you can see that uh, majority of those in the ICU, as in with general hospital beds, are those who are not uh, vaccinated. Looking at our slide that we show every week about that difference between those who are not fully vaccinated versus those who are fully vaccinated and boosted, you can still see that significant difference. Uh, now we have about 280,000 Vermonters who are fully vaccinated and boosted. That population continues to grow, uh, but the number of people requiring hospitalization in that group remains pretty steady. And again, about 11 times difference for those who are fully vaccinated and boosted uh, compared to those who are not fully vaccinated. Another emphasis that we want to make note of is uh, the fact that older Vermonters continue to go to the hospital at a greater rate than any other age group. So you can see here the per capita numbers, those over 65 much more likely to end up in the hospital regardless of their vaccination status. Uh, it's just you know, a fact across the board, although vaccination makes it less likely that you'll need to go to the hospital and that your duration of hospitalization stay will be shorter as well. But again, for those that are in that vulnerable category, um, something to be mindful of uh, over the next few weeks as cases come down. Fortunately, on the next slide, you'll see that the report, uh, reported cases of the flu in the hospital, those that need to be hospitalized for the flu, have remained very low so far this year. So that's uh, certainly good news as it relates to not having additional pressure in our hospital systems. Uh, and we'll, again, hopefully see that continue to stay low uh, through the rest of the flu season. In terms of hospitalizations across New England, we mentioned that we think we'll start to see our hospitalizations fall over the next week. You can start to see some of those other states within the Northeast, uh, New York, Connecticut, 
Massachusetts, they're starting to see their hospitalization numbers already clearly tick down. Again, we think uh, we're just about a week or so behind some of these jurisdictions. We think we'll start to see the same thing uh, over the next week. But even as our uh, hospital improvement has sort of just hopefully started, uh, one thing that we are seeing clearly is an increase in the availability of uh, hospital beds, which certainly is good news. As of today, 65 hospital beds available, 22 ICU beds available. So we've had a trend down in terms of the availability of those uh, types of resources, but that has shifted over the last few days, and we're starting to see more uh, availability across the hospitals. So looking at our COVID-19 uh, fatalities, now 523 fatalities for uh, the um, entire pandemic. You can see we had 43 deaths for the month of January. And just want to make a note of those deaths that we saw for the month of January to date of the 43. So the majority of those deaths, when you look at when they tested positive and when they would have been infected, uh, occurred when the Delta variant was the dominant variant in Vermont. A minority of those deaths have occurred when Omicron was clearly the dominant variant uh, in Vermont. So we do anticipate you know, that the death rate will stay higher until maybe two or three weeks from now, once cases have come down. But we also have to be mindful that a lot of the fatalities that we've been seeing in the month of January were due to the more severe Delta variant rather than the Omicron variant that has become dominant over the last two or three weeks. And again, as we continue to show pretty clearly that if you are not vaccinated and boosted, um, you have a much greater chance of death if you do contract COVID-19. So over nine times difference over the last six weeks for those who are not fully vaccinated compared to those who are fully vaccinated and boosted. And then just finally here, a couple of uh, updates on vaccination slides. You can see Vermont continues to lead the nation in those five uh, to 11 who have started vaccination up to 61.6% and over 50% now fully vaccinated. And as the governor said, Vermonters continue to go and get boosted. Uh, just about 7,800 Vermonters over the last week uh, got their uh, booster shot. So we still have a few hundred thousand that are eligible. We need more and more Vermonters to get that booster shot to put this Omicron wave behind us. Um, and we are doing a pretty good job averaging about 10,000 a week, but we want to see that uh, remain steady and even increase. So if you haven't gotten your booster shot yet, certainly um, make sure you do that at your earliest convenience. And with that, I'll now turn it over to um, Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Good afternoon. Many of our school districts are now transitioning to our new uh, test at home strategy. Before I get into an update on how that's going, I just wanted to recap uh, what that strategy is and why we had to make that change. Uh, test at home expands the use of testing in schools by using antigen tests, which give immediate results. This expansion of testing is coupled with a change in how we are notifying presumed contacts in schools. Previously, uh, this notification process happened through a labor intensive and relatively slow process of contact tracing. Uh, with tests at home, the old contact tracing process in school has been replaced with a more general response notification process. Although test at home, <clears throat> excuse me, greatly expands testing, the use of the testing is tied to specific protocols that uh, are founded in our uh, revised guidance at the state level for isolation and quarantine. Basically, uh, these tests are used in schools dependent on the vaccination status of individuals. When vaccinated individuals are presumed contacts, they are eligible to take home two tests to be administered on the fourth and fifth day after their presumed contact and they would continue to attend school. Unvaccinated individuals who are presumed contacts are eligible to take home five tests, which would be administered daily. Uh, they too would continue to attend school if they test negative each day. Another component of test to home is school nurses will have tests to conduct uh, screening of symptomatic individuals in schools. This is important since many of the milder symptoms of common colds are like those of COVID-19. So why did we have to make this shift in our policy? Uh, the short answer is we had to. Uh, became clear that what we were doing uh, before was not going to work with Omicron, uh, which is more infectious and transmits more rapidly. We saw this play out immediately after the holiday vacation when Omicron was starting to take hold in the state. 
We saw several schools close, not only because of new cases, but because they were placing many students in quarantine because of a backlog in contact tracing. We also saw several districts have difficulty with our guidance on stay home when sick. Schools did not have the capacity or the tools to discern the difference between mild cold symptoms and COVID-19 symptoms, and so they erred on the side of safety. School nurses, who typically would have been involved in making these kinds of clinical decisions, often didn't have sufficient time to do so because they were directly involved in logistics of both test to stay and contact tracing. So test at home uh, was a necessary evolution in our strategy. We made this shift because we had to, not because the timing was ideal, or for that matter, even good. In fact, uh, this is one of the more challenging moments we've seen in schools uh, during the pandemic. But we are working together as we speak, and I'm confident as we get through this moment successfully, uh, we'll get through it just like we have all the other twists and turns uh, that this virus has sent us. Test the home is dependent on the supply of tests. We've been working closely with our partner agencies to ensure schools have enough supplies uh, to implement the program. It is part of a broader state strategy to deploy uh, rapid antigen tests in our communities. Uh, Secretary Samuelson will provide an update on that larger testing effort in her report. We have had situations where schools have run out of tests sooner than projected. Uh, in an environment of these very high case counts, some districts have gone through their supply more quickly than others. When this happens, uh, we rush and to provide tests to them as quickly as possible. Uh, I just want to reassure parents, if your district runs out, don't worry. Uh, they will have more tests soon and schools will remain open and you should send your child to school regardless. We are confident we can manage the supply for this program, uh, but we're also working on the demand. And the demand for the test is not just a function of case counts. It's also a function of us needing to further refine and explain our guidance so the tests are being handled out in accordance with our recommendations. We are working with school districts to develop additional guidance in the form of FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions to refine our protocols, and that's ongoing work that started last week. Our overarching goal is to make test as home as simple as possible to implement, uh, but the flip side of that simplicity is the need to be able to manage and predict supply. Um, this will become easier to do so as we continue to iron out the practical aspects of implementing the program, and certainly uh, become easier to do as hopefully case counts continue to come down. I am asking Vermont families uh, continue to have patience as schools work through the specifics of the new program. Uh, schools are still at the beginning phase of implementing it, and we're working closely with them to troubleshoot it to make sure it can be implemented in every single district in the state. With the transition to the broader deployment of ants and chest and their administration at home, we have lost some of our reporting capability on cases that could be directly attributed to schools. As a result, we stopped updating the school report on the Health Department website as of January 10th. Lastly, I wanted to provide an update on PCR surveillance testing. We are planning to sunset the state level program in the coming weeks. We will work with districts, however, who are interested in maintaining some form of PCR testing availability in their districts. Uh, districts will have access to lamp testing as well, which like PCR is a confirmable test, but has the advantage of giving immediate results. Uh, that concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Sanderson. Good afternoon. Today I'll provide an update on our COVID um, preparedness. I will review the work completed over the last two months to, and highlight Vermont's and Vermonters' ability to adjust and respond to the ever-changing pandemic. We have watched the data carefully, observed what was happening in other countries and other states with Omicron, and used that information to help Vermonters plan and prepare. In some cases, like vaccines, we knew that our existing tools were our best options and defense. In other areas, like testing, contact tracing, and hospital capacity, we identified ways to adjust in response to the high transmissibility of the Omicron variant. The ability to monitor the data and evolve our response has been a key to Vermont's COVID operations. We are now about a month into the Omicron stage of this ongoing pandemic. I'm going to walk through 
each of the areas of operations, starting with vaccines, then testing, contact tracing, and hospital capacity, and identify what's happening in each of these um, areas based on the stage that we're currently at. First, and most importantly, we continue our efforts to get as many people vaccinated and boosted as possible. This is our best defense against significant um, poor outcomes related to COVID and hospitalizations, including with the Omicron variant. As of today, as Commissioner Pichek said, more than 50% of children between the ages of five to 11 are currently vaccinated. And over 50% of Vermonters, 57% of Vermonters aged 12 and up are currently up to date. While these vaccination rates are leading the nation, we hope to see more Vermonters become up to date in their vaccinations. And we continue to make vaccinations as convenient and easy as possible to get, including boosters, which are widely available across the state. In December and January, Vermonters received over 195,000 doses of COVID vaccine at pharmacies, public health clinics, through our healthcare providers, and through other providers. We re with the recent updates to the recommendations for children and booster uh, vaccines and on boosters, there continues to be a focus on school vaccines, including 145 clinics offered in December and January and 38 clinics scheduled in schools between now and early February. In addition, we are spreading out into the communities and going to events, work sites, and other areas where Vermonters are congregating to make it easier for them to get vaccines. This includes holiday shopping, work sites, and ski resorts, and more recently, winter festivals. We have more than 98 clinics spread across the state in December and January so far. We currently have 65 clinics planned through the end of February, and we're adding more every day. To schedule an appointment, you can go to healthvermont.gov backslash COVID-19 backslash vaccines. If you're an employer, a community organization, or a group holding a gathering, where would, we would be excited to come to you. Simply contact us by going to healthvermont.gov and clicking, clicking on your community. Testing is an area where we've had significant effort. We have evolved our testing strategy that in addition to offering PCR tests, which have been critical throughout the pandemic, we are working to get many rapid tests into the hands of Vermonters to take home where they can test in the privacy of their own home. In the face of national shortages, we've still been able to expand our test, the supply of rapid tests coming into Vermont. As part of this effort since early December, we have increased the number of test manufacturers that we're um, supplying for tests in Vermont from one to five, and that has allowed us to focus on getting tests to vulnerable Vermonters, keeping schools open, and ensuring that critical infrastructure is able to operate. We've done this all the while continuing to make sure that we're getting rapid tests in the hands of the general public. All told, more than uh, one million rapid tests have been distributed in Vermont since late December. For the general population, that's been more than 450,000 tests, or 100, more than 100,000 distributed through public testing sites, and 350,000 distributed through the online program Say Yes, which was conducted in partnership with the National Institutes of Health. Focusing on schools, more than 175,000 tests were targeted um, for, for the return to the K-12 schools after the holiday break. In addition, in the month of January, more than 440,000 rapid tests have gone out in, in, to, in, to advance several of our testing programs, as discussed by Secretary French, and also uh, for schools and also for our child care providers. This effort is designed to keep kids in schools and in classrooms and children in their daycare providers. That's more than 600,000 tests focusing on keeping kids in schools and in child care. For our vulnerable Vermonters, since late December, 30,000 rapid tests have been distributed through organizations serving our BIPOC community, through food shelves, 
homeless shelters, emergency housing sites, senior centers, after school programs, libraries and churches and parent child centers, just to name a few. Plans are in place to double that amount, hoping to distribute an additional 30,000 kits to these partners in the coming weeks. It's important to remember that the expansion of the rapid tests are on top of our PCR testing system. Over the same time frame from December through today, Vermonters have accessed more than 300,000 PCR tests through the public testing programs and sites. This includes through healthcare providers, employers, and other providers across the state. As we look forward, we will continue to maintain our PCR-based testing system and expand the availability of rapid take-home tests. Through the federal um, government, individuals in Vermont can also get tests online by going to covidtests.gov. You can also call 855-722-7878 if you're interested in finding out more about when it's appropriate to test and when not. On contact tracing, Vermont stood up one of the best contact tracing programs in the country, and it has truly slowed down the spread of COVID. But traditional contact tracing done by health officials is less effective with a more transmissible Omicron variant. And Vermont has pivoted towards arming Vermonters with information they need to isolate and reach out to their contacts. This transition started nearly two months ago, as has been discussed in several press conferences with the newest evolutions occurring in just earlier this month. Dr. Levine will cover it in more detail momentarily, but it's important to note that our evolution in contact tracing is part of our strategy to follow the science and the data and to keep pace with the COVID variants. And it's in line with our national experts. Lastly, on our healthcare system, we continue to fund 139 subacute beds, which allows hospitals to transfer patients who no longer need hospital level of care to subacute settings. This helps to reduce the pressure on our hospital system. Like other components of our pandemic operations, ensuring the continuity of operations in our healthcare system has evolved. Over the past three weeks, the burden on hospitals and healthcare settings has shifted from the number of cases in the hospitals to the number of staff who were out due to the COVID. Vermont has managed to maintain the staffing needs to keep our hospitals and healthcare organizations functional, initially by bringing in 30 EMS staff and par um, paramedics uh, from FEMA to three hospitals. That cadre has now been reduced to 20. We recognize that other states had greater needs and anticipated this decline in the FEMA staffing. With this in mind, we leveraged a statewide staffing contract to bring more staff to our health care providers. Today, 104 staff are available in long-term care facilities, hospitals, and human services providers. Through the healthcare staffing company TLC, um, with more than 30 staff on their way to Vermont by the end of the month. This crucial resource, um, resources are being deployed where they're needed the most and are to best serve Vermonters and our healthcare system. Finally, 27 members of the National Guard are supporting some of our hospitals by providing food service, maintenance, phlebotomy, and patient observers. This help is critical. Through these efforts, as we change and adapt our policies and programs, our healthcare workers are holding strong but they could use your recognition and encouragement. As you'll recall at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of footage both in Vermont and across the country of Americans going outside and expressing their gratitude and showing solidarity in various ways for healthcare providers, including first responders. As we move into the third year of managing the pandemic, healthcare workers have been on the front lines vaccinating, testing, and caring for those who are sick. So if you know someone who works in the healthcare field, no matter what they do, um, give them a call, send them a text, or drop them an email to let them know that you're grateful for their work. And if you're unvaccinated, the best thing you can do is to get vaccinated to show your support for them. And I'd also want to thank all of the state employees for their work and unprecedented collaboration supporting our testing, tracing, and vaccines and other operations. These dedicated state employees continue to work in partnership with so many Vermonters to support the response 
and infrastructure we have in place. With all of that said, I'd like to turn it over to Public Health Commissioner Dr. Levine. Thank you. So we are continuing to see hopeful signs from the latest surge driven by the Omicron variant. As you've seen, cases appear to have peaked in the Northeast and are on the downslope. We hope this will lead to lower rates of transmission here in Vermont over the next coming weeks, something we'd all very much welcome. Now our case rates are following an improving trend. We've also seen um, corroborating evidence from our Burlington wastewater collection showing improvements in the levels of Omicron detected in all of the uh, stations that are tested in that municipality. Now, one key indicator, which is our hospitalization rate, which was considered high, but as you, can, that, yeah, as you saw, that's for Vermont, and the governor has aptly illustrated the fact that it is certainly not high when compared to the national experience. And these numbers have come down from their prior peak and are really in a steady range over the last week or so. ICU bed availability has been sufficient, and on any given day, at most, only a handful of ICU patients are on ventilators. This is testimony both to the presumed lower virulence of Omicron, but also our ability to manage a patient's breathing in non-invasive ways. Now, many of you have been asking for some time and have questions about how do we count COVID hospitalizations. In short, there are two categories those who are hospitalized for COVID and those who are diagnosed with it after being hospitalized for other reasons. Of the people in the hospital who have COVID, about 67% went in because of their COVID-related illness. And about a third were in the latter category where they were in for another reason but tested positive for COVID. Suffice it to say, though, that every one of these patients are treated and attended to as appropriate for their COVID status and require significant hospital resources and manpower. Things like, do they require isolation? How are they provided for with hospital resources, PPE, staff exposure? All other aspects of hospitalization remain important for both groups. Now, while we look forward to a time when less virus is in our communities, we need to remember COVID is still here. Case rates lower than the peak are far from zero. It is not going away just yet. We've seen how quickly the virus can and does change, but the good news is that it continues that Omicron seems much milder for many people, especially those who've been vaccinated and boosted. Now, while I am certainly delighted that our state ranks first in the percentage of Vermonters who have been boosted, and I firmly believe much of our favorable hospitalization data is because we are so highly boosted, I must once again emphasize that being over 50 or 60 percent boosted for the age 18 and over population is still not nearly good enough. I'd love to see that percentage much closer to 90. So if you are eligible and haven't yet gotten around to it, please jump up, go out today, and get your booster. It takes almost no time at all, or at least make a plan to do so by the end of this week. Now, we use the term variants a lot. Allow me to remind you that variants are viral mutations. The mutation of viruses is a lot like evolution in real-time overdrive. With a planet of people to work with, COVID has certainly fine-tuned its ability to spread. The Omicron variant is so contagious it causes many infections still and compelling public health officials worldwide to quickly consider how best to respond 
to this evolving situation. Now, Vermont began adjusting its strategy earlier this month. We've begun moving to rapid testing in schools and discontinued the slow, laborious, and increasingly ineffective process of universal contact tracing, replacing it with a much more targeted effort in the age of Omicron. This strategy, I'm delighted to say, today has now been supported by national public health leaders, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists, and other leading public health organizations just released a statement supporting health departments in making just this type of transition away from universal contact tracing and case investigation. In their statement, they note many of the points we've spoken of here previously. The shorter incubation period of Omicron, which means the highest risk of transmission occurs before symptoms begin or before a positive test. The large number of infections that are asymptomatic or mild cases, which often means many people never seek testing. Mild cases that never undergo testing and the results of self-tests that are not reported. And widespread vaccination, which is protecting a large portion of us from the most severe outcomes. So this is why we are continuing with this shift in Vermont, fully moving away from contact tracing for the general population, as it is simply no longer effective against this fast-moving variant. We continue to base such decisions on the current science, evaluating the data, and evolving our practices so as to protect and promote the best health for Vermonters. Now, the Health Department had already been prioritizing contact tracing for those at higher risk and asking all Vermonters who <clears throat> tested positive to isolate immediately and reach out to close contacts. Let me assure you that contact tracing for COVID will still be done in certain high-risk settings, like congregate residential settings, long-term care facilities, shelters, correctional facilities, where it can still have an impact. And it remains an important public health tool and will continue to be used for many other important infectious diseases, just not the current variant of SARS-CoV-2. On an individual basis, the Health Department will be contacting all Vermonters who have tested positive for COVID-19 when we receive a lab result. This will help ensure that people quickly receive the guidance they need to isolate and notify their own contacts, as we've already been asking them to do. They'll also be connected to specific resources if they are in need. So if you do get a call from the Health Department, please know it is likely because we've received a positive result and answer the call you need to make sure you have the information you need to protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. It'll be a very brief call since there won't be a lot of questions asked about your exposures or your contacts. The reason for the call is to go over the steps to take now and talk about what needs you may have. With these tools, we can empower Vermonters to act quickly to slow the further spread of the virus right now. During the Omicron surge, it's critical to stay home if you feel sick, wear a mask indoors, avoid crowds, and gather safely. Help encourage others to get vaccinated and boosted. And although treatments for COVID are limited by the federal supply right now, please reach out to your health care provider if you are at higher risk and have tested positive. I also want to speak very briefly about concerns that student athletes, their parents, the VPA, and schools have regarding return to play after COVID. The pandemic has led to a seemingly endless set of complex hoops for us all to jump through. Not the least are families and schools trying to manage all aspects of education and extracurriculars. Keep in mind that Omicron has only been in this country and this state on the order of weeks and not months. The national organizations that set guidelines and provide guidance to our healthcare professionals are working quickly to try to bring their guidance in line with the science as it develops real time. I can't promise that 
These recommendations will unfold any less complicated than they have, but I can assure everyone that any requirements will continue to be driven by the science and the medical decision-making process of pediatricians, providers, and students and families. All with the goal of safeguarding the health of the individuals, as well as their fellow athletes and their school community. I want to end on a final note to address a topic that seems to be coming up more now that we're dealing with a relatively milder variant and a highly vaccinated population. Should we all just get COVID and get it over with? My answer is no, and I'll give you a few reasons why. Even though many of us are vaccinated and highly protected from serious outcomes, we cannot always predict who may become seriously ill. Also, our hospitals remain strained, albeit more by workforce issues than bed capacity. And if you do get sick enough to go to the hospital, you may face delays in care, and you'd only be adding to their strain. Your own health may be just fine, but you could still spread the virus to someone else who's too young to get vaccinated or is vulnerable and at higher risk for COVID. No one wants to be sick now. Even milder COVID symptoms can be miserable for some. And the inconveniences of having to miss school or work while you're isolating can really add up. Not to mention, we still don't have a lot of data about Omicron and long COVID or whether and how soon you could be infected again. And we do expect more treatment options are on the way, <clears throat> in addition to access to rapid tests and high quality masks. The longer we can avoid getting Omicron, the more likely <clears throat> we are to have more options to protect ourselves and others moving forward. As always, I want to thank all Vermonters for their patience during this tumultuous time. I know how difficult it is to adjust to changing guidance as new science comes to light, but I hope we can all maintain our shared value for public health as we begin to emerge from this latest surge together. Governor? Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Starting with folks in the room. Dr. Levine, another question for you on, on that front. Is there any talks of needing a second booster shot anytime soon? And what may that look like as far as the timeline goes? So there is no talk in the United States for needing a second booster shot. So no timeline either. It's really going to be evaluated over the course of the next calendar year uh, to see how well boosting uh, you know, induced immunity is maintained. I will comment that the country of Israel has, of course, gotten way ahead of the curve on this, starting with people age 60 and older or higher risk, and now they're trying to expand that to younger portions of the population. Uh, many in their country, though, in the scientific community do admit that they, too, are still accumulating the data, and they may not have the data yet to fully support any, uh, certainly any U.S. switch in policy at this time. Before you leave, um, I just wanted to ask about the very encouraging, optimistic presentation that uh, Secretary, excuse me, Commissioner Pichek gave. I just gave you a promotion, Mike. Um, <laughs> It's, I think Vermonters appreciate that optimism. We, we want reasons to be optimistic. But if the data is not really complete, because I think we all know that people aren't necessarily reporting the self-test data, how much confidence should we have in that data? I would still have a lot of confidence in it because we're seeing a consistent amount of testing throughout most of those days that uh, the data has been provided for. So even though we know there's all this additional testing superimposed on the testing system, we know we get results from, um, I think we can be pretty confident about that. I think we'll also start to see, um, really based on the hospital data being in a very stable place, uh, that we're not seeing additional new cases all the time that would have gotten more serious. Because even as we said earlier, when you have a less severe variant, you may have less people in the hospital, but when you have way more people with that less severe variant, you'll still have more people in the hospital proportionately. And we're not seeing that happen at this time. Did you want to say something as well? 
Uh, Dr. Levine mentioned it during his presentation, but the wastewater detection from Burlington is, is sort of confirmatory in terms of the trend that we're seeing with the, the amount detected trending down most recently. Um, you know, that cuts through the fact whether somebody doesn't test at all, whether they do an at-home test, whether they do PCR test, it's sort of, you know, collecting, um, you know, independent of that. So, you know, one of our largest communities in, in Vermont uh, sort of confirming that downward trending cases, similar to what was being seen in Boston um, and Massachusetts in terms of their wastewater um, reduction and then their case reduction as well. So I just think another important data point. If there's a million tests that have been distributed since December, do we have any guesses about how many unreported self-test results are out there? Anyone want to venture a guess? <laughs> I wouldn't venture a guess, but we have in excess of 5,000 positive results that have been reported, which is a huge number. Just to add um, and belabor the point, um, you know, from the very beginning, we said we were going to watch the hospitalizations, and that's what we've done. And when you couple that with the number of people in the hospital with COVID, not because of COVID, uh, I think it does make the point uh, that uh, we're seeing a, a, mild, a milder variant. Um, but, um, um, but if we keep focusing on the hospitalizations, uh, the health of uh, Vermonters, I think that's the, the, the best metric to use, and it's consistent. So that's why we've done it from the beginning. Governor, maybe a, a quick follow-up for Dr. Levine. Um, we don't know, I guess, what, what do we know about this new BA.2 variant? I guess it's a, an offshoot of Omicron. There's a few cases recorded out in Washington. What, what can you tell us about this new variant? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> There's just not a lot of information right now. And I don't think it's being, I'm, I'm pretty confident it's not being listed as a variant of concern. I'm not even sure if it's graduated to the variant of interest level at this point in time. And I also want to just say the 5,000, actually 200 plus cases that I mentioned earlier are since December 20th. So literally in a one month period. Um, what time this week, or when this week, um, Vermonters can expect to get the um, N95 masks in pharmacies and community health centers? Um, maybe, is Commissioner Shirley on? Hi, I am, Governor. Uh, uh, it was hard to hear the question. I think it was how many N95 masks. Yeah, we when, when, no, it was uh, when they will be distributed uh, this week. Uh, I think di uh, distribution is going on on a rolling basis, um, so I'd have to uh, check for an update uh, from emergency management to get you a, a specific uh, timeline for, for various areas. We can get that to you, Jolie. Um, back, back to your question and about the, the comment about the variant. I just think we all have to be um, aware and prepared. There's going to be other variants. Uh, that's the nature of the beast and it's something that we've seen. And they'll be in different forms. And hopefully, uh, if they are a variant of the Omicron, it'll be much less severe. So that's what we're hoping for. But, but again, this is something that we have to be prepared for over the next couple of years, not uh, um, not something to be concerned with, but just to be something to be aware of. Governor Scott, something not COVID related. You proposed using half of the surplus in our education fund to give money back to Vermont homeowners. Um, you tweeted that out uh, recently and got some backlash on Twitter, folks saying that there are plenty of ways that that money could be used to improve various parts of the education system. So. What would your response be to people who think that $45 million should go back into the education system? Yeah, well, we spend a billion dollars for education. We have a lot of money right now in relief money, ESSER dollars, ESSER 1, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars still there to invest in uh, different aspects of, uh, of uh, education. Um, this is something, you know, I, that Vermonters overpaid. They paid too much over and above what was needed. So it just from my standpoint, 
it should be returned to them in some way, at least part of it. And, uh, and I think it's the right thing to do uh, because, again, we can spend money. Uh, we can continue to spend money. But, but at some point, uh, Vermont, I think, I've, I've identified this from the very beginning, I think affordability is a, an issue for us. And if we have an opportunity to, to make it a little um, more affordable by giving some back, I think we should do so. Maybe, Secretary French, anything you want to add to that? Go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, to echo the governor's uh, comments, there's, uh, it's, it's an interesting dilemma to have for the education fund. Um, but it is, it's a moment where there's a lot of federal dollars coming into the state and school districts. Uh, you know, we think about like school construction projects and so forth. Money's not necessarily the issue with those projects sometimes. It's often finding the contractors to do the work, uh, finding the workers to do the work and so forth. So it is an interesting moment. Um, and you know, I would agree that uh, it reminds me of any annual conversation about a school district surplus. You have, that, you have to balance those needs with um, providing immediate relief to the taxpayers. As the governor mentioned, it's essentially money they overpaid in the form of their taxes. Um, and that, that needs to be reconciled with what the needs of the system are. But right now, the system's in pretty good shape relative to the additional federal dollars that are coming in. Um, so I think it's, it's a reasonable uh, approach and one that uh, should be embraced by policymakers. Governor Scott, um, what, what do you make of the latest version of the, the Budget Adjustment Act? That's the Senate is looking to fast track this week put on your desk and, and specifically what do you make of the, the 50 million dollar um, investment in uh, the pension funds well again um, there's 150 million that's been set aside uh, they took another 50 million for whatever they um, have agreed upon um, but i think i it was two weeks ago i said that uh, uh, the devil is always in the details and i don't have any details in the same um, same thing holds true today. I, I don't have any details on what this does, and and uh, and I don't mind paying down debt. I don't mind making investments, um, but uh, in this case, uh, we we'll want to be sure that it makes the structural changes uh, that won't lead us into the same position we're in today. So if this doesn't fix the problem, if we put 200 million or and I've heard upwards to 300 million. I'm just not sure what the figure is, but if, uh, if we're going to invest 200 million into the, the pensions, uh, we, we probably should make sure uh, that we're, we're laying this out so it's sustainable in the future. And I, and I don't know if it does that or not. Um, as you might recall, it was just uh, two, three years ago, I was in a bit of a, a disagreement with the legislature on how to spend, I think it was 34 million. They wanted to put it into pensions and said that it would reduce our, our liability, reduce our payments. That didn't hold true. I mean, our payments are increasing, not decreasing. That investment didn't, didn't do any good uh, because we didn't make the structural changes uh, to give us a, a best return. So again, the devil is in the details and we just have not seen the details unless you have or others have. I just, we just haven't seen them, but look forward to them and look forward to working with the legislature on this. Governor, another question about COVID. Since we last saw you in this venue, uh, Vermont passed the very sad milestone of 500 deaths. Uh, of course, you know, they're more than a number, they're human beings. Uh, would you mind just sort of reflecting uh, for us on what that milestone meant to, to you and what it should mean to all Vermonters who lost that many neighbors? Yeah, I think, uh, Again, every death is tragic, and in particular with, with COVID, it's, um, it's something, you know, years ago, three years ago, two years ago, we didn't expect. Um, and while we still, you know, are one of the leaders in the nation in terms of uh, deaths per capita, um, it still means something that it's a family member, a friend, uh, a colleague uh, who, is, uh, who has passed away due to, due to the virus. So it, uh, from my standpoint, it, it continues uh, to be a point what we have to continue to reflect on. Um, and it's not just a number, um, but it's a reason for us to do the very best we can uh, to get people vaccinated, get them boosted, uh, try to put this behind us uh, so that we don't have any 
uh, additional deaths in the future. Um, but, but we can, again, we can be proud of the fact that we've done, um, we're one of the best states in the nation in terms of, of preventing death, but we still tragically had too many deaths as a result. today the term being up to date you know get up to date on your vaccines is that what we're now using instead of fully vaccinated you know can you reconcile the like what the terminology is that we're using now yeah i think the words fully vaccinated are now antiquated archaic we shouldn't use that anymore we should consider fully protected and up to date those are really i think the words that count the most Unfortunately, that's what we're saying in Vermont, but, you know, depending on where you go, there may be different terminology used. But the belief is, if you really want to consider yourself protected, you need to be boosted. And, you know, you know it's wonderful that you chose to get your primary vaccine series, but having done that, um, you now need to just keep up just like you do with your tetanus shots. Thank you. All right, we'll move now on to the phone, starting with Wilson Ring, AP. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. As always, thank you for doing this. Um, Governor, a month or so ago, uh, you mentioned how many people in, you think there are in Vermont who have not, who have either not been, uh, not been infected or not been vaccinated. And I think the number you said at the time was about 100,000. What would you estimate that number is now? And at the same time, more recently, you said something to the effect of, if you're not vaccinated, you're going to get it. Uh, and how many people are remain to in, in both of those categories? And it might be the same number. Well, again, in my remarks, I, I mentioned the CDC has us at 95% in terms of um, of those who have been vaccinated in some capacity. So that would leave us to believe there's probably 30,000 that have not received any type of vaccination whatsoever. Um, but, uh, but again, as we've seen, uh, if you haven't been up to date and fully protected, uh, you're still at risk of, uh, of contracting uh, this disease, uh, the COVID. Uh, but, um, but you're much, much better protected uh, the more up-to-date you are. So I think we've seen um, over the last few weeks uh, that, uh, that that fact held true, um, that if you weren't protected in some way, uh, it wasn't just a question of, of uh, if, it was just a question of when. Right? And we saw a number of people who were unvaccinated uh, contract uh, this, uh, this latest variant. Yeah, Omicron. And, and how many do you think are in that category who are unprotected? Is that the 30,000 you mentioned? I'm just pulling that out the top of my head. Maybe Commissioner Pichet can give some, uh, some numbers and numbers to it. Yeah, thanks, Wilson. I, I think, you know, the two categories are those that, you know, have natural immunity and those that have vaccination immunity. And just from the natural natural immunity standpoint, you know, we um, just went over 100,000 cases today in, in Vermont. So out of 600 and, you know, 23,000 plus uh, people, um, we've always said that there's some number of unreported infections, you know, the, uh, the actual amount of infections that are incurring. That used to be like two, you know, two and a half times maybe. With Omicron, the estimates are maybe it's, you know, four or five times the number of cases that we're seeing. So, you know, there's, there's at this point quite a few people that um, have gotten uh, COVID in Vermont. Now, whether they still have natural immunity if they got in March 2020 to now, probably not. So that's part of the calculation that's kind of hard to determine. Uh, if you look at how many people are fully vaccinated, how many are, or rather, how many people are not fully vaccinated who are eligible, you know, there's maybe 70,000 or so that are not fully vaccinated who are eligible. There's another 33,000 maybe that are under five years old. So, you know, when you put those populations together, you get down to a pretty small number that probably hasn't either had natural immunity uh, or some uh, vaccination immunity. Okay, and, and a final question on all of this. You keep asking 
encouraging people to get vaccinated or boosted or both. Um, do you think that message, you've been using that message well since the vaccines rolled out and they became available, do you think people are still listening? Well, I think something is working. I don't know if they're listening to us or they're just doing the right thing, uh, but, uh, but we're a leader in the nation in regards to uh, boosting and uh, vaccination rates. So something is getting through. And, uh, and again, I'm not saying that we should take credit for that, but it's been a consistent message from the very beginning. And uh, we are seeing the benefit of that, but we continue to need people to keep, you know, Moving forward, we still need people uh, to uh, to become up to date uh, with their vaccinations and being boosted. Dr. Levine, and I, and I think the data that uh, Commissioner Puchak showed on one slide uh, basically shows every week we continue to have abundant people come to mostly get boosted. Their majority are boosting and not uh, starting a fresh series just because there aren't so many left who need to start a fresh series. So I think they are hearing the message. And to sort of synthesize both your questions into one, the message is not um, that you're gonna get sick from Omicron, so why get vaccinated? Because yes, even if you're, you're vaccinated and boosted, you may actually test positive or have a mild illness from Omicron. But the most important message is you're not gonna be a statistic. You're not gonna be in the hospital. You're not gonna be in the ICU. You're much less likely to be a death if you've gotten the full vaccine series and been boosted. And that's what the vaccines are here to protect us all from. Okay, thank you very much. The, the other aspect of all of this on Vermont um, is the level of difficulty uh, due to the, our demographics uh, where the one of the top three, a third uh, oldest states in the nation and achieving what we've been able to achieve, whether it's hospitalizations or deaths, um, is remarkable and, and is a testament to what Vermonters are doing because uh, it, this has affected the elderly more than anyone else, both in terms of death and in terms of hospitalization. So, so we have a lot to be proud of uh, because of, again, adding that level of difficulty uh, due to our, our age. Hey, thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Chris Roy. All right, we'll move to Joseph Gresser, Barton Chronicle. Joseph, we can see you, but I think you might be muted. All right, we'll move to Lisa Loomis, Dyer Porter. Oh, I see Lisa in the. Lisa Loomis, Dyer Porter. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Great, I'm back in the nick of time. Um, Dr. Levine, you mentioned that when the health department calls, um, they're calling very specifically to give people information about how to contact, uh, what to do if they test positive, but you also mentioned that the health department would help people with resources. What does that mean specifically? Does that mean access to food, shelter, money to pay for not working? Uh, at least two out of three of those, uh, for sure. So uh, if you're unable to isolate uh, alone or in a home or don't have a home or what have you, uh, or you're putting others at risk and you want to go to a facility where you can be isolated, that can be established during that call. If you are able to isolate but you're concerned about things like deliveries of food, groceries, um, medications, what have you, uh, that's when all of that information can be transmitted, you know, needs established, and uh, a, a path forward for you. So that's what's the intention for that. 
Great. Thank you very much. And I want to follow up on Jolie's question to Commissioner Sherling about the availability of KN95 and N95 masks for adults and children. What I heard was a very generic response in that they're being rolled out throughout the state. Can we get some more clarification on that? Do they exist? How many exist? And how will distribution take place? Certainly, uh, it, it's not that that information isn't available, it's that I don't have that information in front of me right now. Uh, for emergency management, it's uh, managing that, and I've been uh, immersed in, in legislative activity for the last few days, so I just don't have an updated uh, assessment. Um, at a minimum, uh, there are a number of sites around the state where masks are being distributed simultaneous to uh, testing and uh, vaccination operations, although uh, I would caution that those we don't want people to go to those sites specifically to get masks. In terms of what's available, we have uh, upwards of 3 million uh, masks of varying types, 2.2 million uh, procedure masks, uh, something on the order of 700,000 KN95s, and another half a million medical grade uh, N95s, which would not be distributed uh, publicly. I just note that they exist. Those are for medical use. Um, and I can get more information. Uh, I've, I've actually already requested more information. We can get you a breakdown of uh, distribution operations as soon as I have it. Great, because people would like to know where are those sites where they could go pick up such masks, and will those sites where masks are available be linked on the state vaccination and testing website in some place? Yeah. Uh, important to note, so you, you, you see that an interesting uh, an opportunity to, again, remind folks that uh, masks of really of all types are at this stage ubiquitously available around the state from hardware stores to uh, uh, grocery stores, um, pharmacies, et cetera. So um, finding them, it, it, they are not a rare commodity as they were in uh, early 2020 when we were stockpiling. Um, so the, the first bet to have easy access to a mask is to, to look to local Retail or even online retailers, uh, the price of those masks are, uh, are are fairly nominal at this stage. Uh, a couple of other quick notes around masks. Um, layering is something that uh, is uh, recommended. So if you've got a cloth mask, um, you can find instructions online for uh, layering that with a procedure or surgical mask um, to increase efficacy. And additionally, um, of note that uh, when you, if you do get a hold of something like a KN95, whether that's through retail or through one of our distribution mechanisms, um, that it is uh, they're not being distributed as uh, as medical grade. So if you you shouldn't be in close proximity to someone who's a known COVID patient or someone who's in isolation or quarantine. They are precautionary, and while they have a higher grade of efficacy uh, against the Omicron variant based on testing. Um, precautions uh, are still necessary. So all the uh, opportunity to provide a, a variety of context around masking and, and the various options and opportunities. Thank you. I do appreciate that. And with all due respect, there are many people in our state who can't necessarily afford to purchase proper masks from the hardware store. And I think that availability and ready knowledge of where people who can't afford to buy protective masks where they can pick up those masks will be important going forward. We'll get back to you with that shortly. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Aaron Patenko, VT Digger. Hi. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to hear more about the experience of long-term care facilities um, as they are experiencing what appears to be the biggest surge in cases since basically winter of, of 2020. Um, you know, we, we have some details about how, um, how cases have risen in long-term care facilities, but have you listed data on kind of severe illness and death among long-term care residents? Dr. Levine. Yes, thanks for asking that, Aaron, because uh, that table that was shown earlier can be rather um, imposing, I guess would be the word, um, and make you think the worst. Um, so indeed, we are seeing many, many more cases in long-term care facilities. Uh, 
I've gotten a recent report from our health care facility outbreak prevention and response team, which basically uh, is mostly reassuring. Uh, some of the cases are in the staff who generally are younger and uh, having milder illnesses, though of course it precipitates absenteeism uh, and stresses the workforce more. The cases that are in many of the residents of these facilities are either test positive but no symptoms or very mild symptoms. There are, of course, some very, very vulnerable people who live in our highest level of care facilities, the skilled nursing facilities, that have many underlying illnesses and even a mild or moderate case of COVID can really be the straw that breaks the camel's back and make them quite ill or even cause death. When we look at our outbreaks across facilities right now, uh, even when the outbreaks are in the 20s and 30s or more of people, generally those facilities are showing zero, one, or two deaths at most. So uh, it's not anywhere like the beginning of the pandemic when we would have 50 to 100 people in a facility and unfortunately, because it was really in an era of pre-testing, uh, pre-vaccine, pre any treatments that we had available, uh, we would see a, a significant number of deaths. So it's a very, very different picture right now. Not to minimize the fact people are getting infected in those facilities, but due to the very high vaccination rate of the residents themselves, uh, the majority of them are actually doing well. Um. The, uh, the long-term care ombudsman office just published a report expressing concern that um, low staffing levels in long-term care facilities um, have led to a reduction of care uh, at all levels, um, not only for COVID, but for other, um, you know, aspects of the resident's life as well. Um, you know, is the state planning to do kind of any additional follow-up to that report or um, kind of analyze it in the context of COVID about whether there's anything we can do to help long-term care facilities that are under this strain? So uh, what I can say is uh, I need to see the report because I haven't yet seen that report. But our Department of Aging and Independent Living um, really is the regulatory arm of what happens in those facilities. So they are pretty up to date on uh, the status of care and the quality of care and actually intervene when needed when that's an issue. The state, as Secretary Samuelson recited today, has done a tremendous amount for providing uh, for care when uh, the facilities themselves had uh, no, no other caregivers to provide uh, through a variety of contracts that we've had that have allowed beds to be opened up and open beds to remain staffed uh, at times of workforce stress as we're in now. So um, that's about the best I can do to answer that at this point in time. Okay, um, I see that there probably isn't anyone from Dale on the call. Um, would someone from AHS like to comment on that? Um, I don't know if you have anything to add. I don't believe there's anyone from Dale, but Secretary Samuelson's coming to the podium. Yeah, I don't have anything to add at this point. I think Dr. Levine is correct. We've done a significant amount of effort to get uh, staffing into those facilities. Um, in some rare instances, we are uh, helping to support facilities who are um, struggling with staffing. Um, in order to keep up their care. But I, I'll have to look at the report and get back to you to be able to specifically comment on it. Okay, thank you. And just, you bring up a good point, um, Aaron, in terms of staffing, um, whether it's the hospitals or the long-term care facilities or any of the uh, psychiatric facilities we have, everyone is facing staffing shortages as well as every single sector across the state. Uh, whether it's law enforcement or manufacturing. So uh, this is an area that, uh, as you know, um, I, I pinpointed in the budget, everything is revolving around workforce uh, and how do we grow 
our, our workforce and uh, in healthcare uh, being one. So uh, we hope the uh, legislature, it seems as though uh, they, have, um, they have the same interests at this point. Um, so we'll uh, see what we can do uh, because this isn't going away after COVID uh, even uh, subsides, but we're still going to have these staffing shortages throughout. Right, we'll okay, that's it for me. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I'm trying to understand exactly what the protocol is when getting information from the state police. Uh, uh, our team ran a story because the state police was seeking information for a uh, missing juvenile in the Northeast Kingdom. It's from the Derby Barracks. Uh, and uh, Compass Vermont published that story. Uh, not hearing anything, uh, we followed up three times at the action barracks and then once uh, in Montpelier just to find out if there was any update on the status and received no information. Uh, we understand that sometimes uh, ensuing circumstances can be confidential, but it's just a Status report is something. I'm wondering if there's a protocol to be able to get that. Commissioner Sherling. Certainly. Uh, it's, it's been my lucky day for questions today. Um, you should be getting a response even when uh, or if there isn't any information to add. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Adam Silverman is our public information officer. Uh, that would be the first stop. And if that doesn't work, um, if Adam is off or encumbered with something, uh, certainly call the barracks, ask to speak with a, a supervisor or the barracks commander. And if you get no response, feel free to email or call me and I will facilitate one. If I can just loop back to Lisa's question, um, no granular detail yet, but the distribution methodology for Vermonters who need masks but can't afford them is through the Agency of Human Services field offices who are also doing distribution to community service agencies in their particular districts. So if Vermonters are listening and they need masks, the first call I would suggest is to any community service agency that you might be engaged with. And in the event you're not, a uh, human services office will be able to uh, point you to where to get a mask or, or actually give you one uh, if you were to stop in there. Okay, thank you. I would like to point out that uh, uh, we sent out uh, two emails, made two calls, left two messages at the barracks and then did contact Mr. Silverman, who's usually pretty quick at responding, but this one has just gone uh, unresponded to. So I do appreciate knowing how to continue to get information just because the public sits worried not knowing what the circumstances are. I will ping the uh, public information officer now, and if you don't have a, a response of some sort by the end of the day, feel free to reach out to me. Appreciate your help. Thanks very much. That's all I have. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Hey. Oh, I think we had you for a second, Greg. All right, we'll move to Guy Page from Mont Daily Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Uh, it's a question for you or, or Commissioner Levine or, or Secretary French. Uh, I've heard that some uh, Vermont high schools are requiring EKGs for student athletes who, are, who have tested COVID positive. Uh, could you uh, comment on this and uh, say whether this is a, a growing trend or not? Yeah, this is a return to sports. I think uh, Commissioner Levine had spoke about this in his remarks, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I'll keep this rather general because uh, even before we get updated guidelines that are Omicron specific, which haven't happened yet, the longstanding guidelines throughout the pandemic have been for uh, ascertaining the level of illness and symptomatology that the high school student would have had with their illness and 
coming to a clinical judgment about the need for an EKG based on that. So obviously someone with a mild cold and nothing else uh, would not necessarily need an EKG, though they might need still a graduated return and a number of days uh, till return. But someone with a more moderate or significant illness or someone with some underlying pre-existing issues might require an EKG. So it would be inappropriate to just generalize and say any high school student that had a positive COVID test needs an EKG first. And I'm not aware if schools are actually doing that. But um, certainly the pediatric community is not doing that. So you're not aware of this happening in Vermont schools? Well, it's the schools don't necessarily make the decision. It's a, it's a medical decision made between the health care provider for the student and the student. So the school may develop its own policy, I suppose, but they've been usually very respectful of the medical community being able to assure them that if a student has been ascertained to be ready to return to play sports, that all the appropriate diagnostic and uh, other interventions have been made before that decision was made. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm also wondering if, given the, the low rates of uh, hospitalization among children and the hopefully reduced uh, virility of, uh, of Omicron and the high vaccination rates, at, at some point, when will our, our schools be returning to a parent, the parents deciding about masking and not the, not the school districts? Hi, Guy, this is Dan French. Uh, in our most recent updated guidance, uh, you might re recall we have a recommendation on 80% vaccination rate and masking. Uh, we push that back to February 28th. So I, that isn't a direct answer to your question, but it gives you a sign of sort of where our thinking is at the moment. We're going to evaluate the circumstances and we'll, as we have throughout the pandemic, revise our recommendations accordingly. So could you expand on that a little bit? I'm sorry, I missed the, the, the context of that. Yeah, so our longstanding uh, recommendation for this school year, starting at the beginning of school, is that school districts should require masks for students. We have an exception in that to when a student vaccination rate level in a school reaches 80%, a mask may be removed. Uh, we push back the implementation of that recommendation, I believe, three times now, and most recently pushed it back to uh, after February vacations, which is approximately February 28th. And in our most recent guidance, we signaled that not only are we pushing it back to the 28th, but we'll also reevaluate it at that point. So at the moment, Everyone wears the masks, and on February 28th, they're going to look at, okay, what do we, what do we do now? The, the whole, are we going to even be thinking about the whole 80 percent, 80 percent mark? Yeah, right now it's our recommendation that school districts require masks, and that we've deferred action mm -hmm. on the 80 percent exception until February 28th. Okay. All right. Thank you. Andrew McGregor, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, uh, for Secretary French, again, uh, questions on the test at home uh, policy. Um, are schools expected or allowed to verify the testing is being completed at home when called for? Thank you for the question. No, actually, uh, there is no expectation that they do so. As part of our, I would say, compromise in our policy to uh, alleviate some of that um, surveillance uh, strain on schools to monitor essentially the public health policy. So there is no expectation that they do that. It's essentially, I want to say, an honor system in that regard. The trade-off is uh, that we're, we're now sending out far more tests into the community than we did previously. Do schools have any recourse to turn kids away when it's known families are choosing not to test? No. What about um, when students are being sent to school who are symptomatic or known to be positive. 
if they're symptomatic, uh, that is something that we address uh, in schools in our guidance as well. Symptomatic students should not be attending school. But you know the same the scenarios you describe existed prior to test at home, um, and you know I would argue uh, part of what we saw going on before that led to a lot of stress in schools was a lot of the conflict that was being set up between school nurses in particular and parents in terms of cooperating, and just the broader sense of fatigue that was setting in. Uh, so one of the certainly one of the aspects of test at home I think that'll be more successful is not only the the broader uh, distribution of testing but also a higher degree of cooperation. I think it'll be easier for folks to comply with. Cooperation. Uh, students and staff uh, still allowed to attend school even when the school lacks the sufficient supply of tests and, and they may want to be testing. Is that a true statement? I missed the last part of the question, but um, yes, even when supplies uh, aren't there, we've had ex uh, issues where Schools uh, didn't have supplies to continue that students are allowed to continue to attend school. What do you say to school staff and families that feel all of this is a step in the wrong direction in terms of keeping schools safe? Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, you point to a lot of the anxiety that um, came up pretty, pretty immediately and forcefully when we announced this need to do the pivot. Um, but I think it's just important to acknowledge, you know, again, that, you know, we've heard from Dr. Levine, his colleagues in the broader medical community and now at the national level, um, that, you know, if, if folks were having some comfort in the idea of comfort, contact tracing or surveillance testing in this environment, they, they perhaps should not have. And uh, we think this new approach will uh, provide a greater degree of safety. But also, I think equally important, and this is, I think, important to acknowledge as part of this new approach, we're also balancing the risk for education of students not being in school. And we had, uh, earlier this fall, we had large numbers of students being excluded from school, and that brings a lot of risk. Even with test to stay, which was a more targeted approach, we saw, I think, a 1% positivity rate in test to stay. So even that being a more targeted approach was still yielding uh, the quarantining of a large number of students that never had COVID. So, you know, it's important that we increasingly try to seek that balance between not only the safety, but also the educational needs of students. And as I've pointed out before, that educational need is a cumulative need, and it's been accumulating for the last two years. So there is some sense of urgency that we do our best to keep schools open and uh, keep kids in school as best we can. Um, are all AOE staffers back to normal operations, working in person in the state offices at this point? No. Um, AOE employees are just like all state employees. Uh, we're back, but there are uh, exemptions for a telework policy that's enacted across state government. Uh, but no telework policy for school staff who are expected to be in person. That's correct. Uh, you know, the, the, that, this sort of uh, comment has come up at the very beginning uh, of the pandemic, I would say. Uh, the nature of our work is fundamentally different at the agency than it is in schools itself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. A follow-up question for Dr. Levine. What's the health department's recommendation uh, for what should happen um, if a student or staff has been identified with an exposure risk but can't or won't test? Uh, can't test because there's not supply or, or maybe chooses not to. I think if there's uh, no supply, a call to us would help because we can direct supply there. Uh, if the problem is choosing not to, um, again, if you are a student who's been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, I hate to use that term again, but that's what we're using for the schools. Uh, if you've been a student, uh, you can continue to come to school without testing. We do recommend a day three or day five test. If you're an unvaccinated student, um, we are counting on you to be testing on a daily basis if you've had that significant exposure uh, before you come back to school. So that continues to be our guidance. So if the school doesn't have enough tests to distribute to unvaccinated known exposure risks, should they stay home or should they come to school? The school should be connecting with us so that we can get them the test kits they need. Sort of a dodge, but I'll accept it. Thank you. Michael Doherty, Vermont Digger. Thanks. Uh, another question for Dr. Levine, and this is a question I think that 
always pops up when numbers are going up or going down sharply. Um, and that's, you know, how should people change their own individual behaviors, if at all? And right now, if these numbers keep moving in a positive direction, how will people who maybe are still behaving very cautiously know that we've reached some kind of baseline where it's okay to loosen up? Yeah, these are indeed the important questions. Um, first of all, I want to preach against overconfidence because we're still at a time, <clears throat> we're grateful for the direction of the curve, but we're still at a time of high levels of community transmission. So this is not the time uh, to totally loosen up completely. But at the same time, uh, for people who are up to date and fully protected, uh, who have been cautious to do things, uh, the environment is getting better so that um, they may feel more comfortable in a uh, setting that they might not have felt comfortable with, with the curve going up. So I'll just say that. One of the things that we're discussing very actively as a team right now, and in fact, uh, this afternoon we're having further discussions, not just within our team, but with the CDC, uh, has to do with this transition to endemicity, to the point in time when we can really feel like the virus is at a lower level and it's going to be like other viruses that come and go in our existence every year and uh, that we have chosen to live with over time, whether it be you know, rhinoviruses, whether it be influenza viruses, et cetera. So um, this is the time for us to begin thinking about how that world will look for all of us. The other thing people should keep a focus on, um, the initial map that Commissioner Pichek showed around the country was essentially uh, purple with some gradations of red and then greener areas. Uh, depending on where you set your threshold levels, the whole country looks purple on some maps if you look at the New York Times. Um, and so you have to be careful to understand what's the level of transmission of virus going on at a point in time. So it's one thing to see our numbers come down and to see the national numbers curving in the same direction. It's another thing to qualify for a level of virus transmission that's below high and substantial, more in the low to moderate range. Because that indicates that a lot has happened in your external environment that will enable you to begin to do all of those things that you want to do more freely once again. So we'll be reporting on this sort of uh, next phase of trying to get to endemic um, over time as we uh, go through the next several weeks uh, because that is a focus of what we want to be able to inform Vermonters on as well. I guess that, that's very interesting to hear that the, those conversations are taking place. And I'm curious about kind of where your head is at now going into those conversations. And one thing in particular uh, that I'm curious about is, you know, if we do find ourselves in a lull where Omicron seems to be in the rearview mirror, do you think we could expect any of the protocols that we've moved away from to come back? For example, contact tracing for the general public or just kind of generally practicing more of a containment strategy do you think that would be back on the table or no? Well, I think it's so hard to say because, you know, what comes after Omicron, as the governor was sort of saying many minutes ago in this press conference, uh, we, we, you know, we hope that Omicron does what it did in South Africa and some other places and really gets suppressed down to a very low level. But we've also seen what's happened in the UK and other places where it's come down and then it's sort of leveled off. and. Nobody's really sure where it's going. Uh, and the key emphasis continues to be vaccinating as much of the nation and the world as possible so the next new variant with its new Greek name uh, doesn't become an issue that is a game changer again in terms of our scientific approach to how we live. So it's really hard to do the hypothetical, you know, what's contact tracing going to be like, et cetera, um, when we don't really know what's around the corner yet. I will say, though, that in a state that is this highly vaccinated, and especially when we get to being as highly boosted as I know we will get to be over time, um, I think that does allow for a little bit different approach. And then cases of whatever variant we're dealing with 
will probably be more unique and hopefully not uh, spread throughout the whole population. And we can almost do a containment strategy knowing uh, that people who are going to be accessing testing are probably doing it because they're sick in some way. We'll have some surveillance tests and wastewater uh, surveillance testing in place as well. And so we'll have an indication of where disease is. And you can almost imagine a SWAT-like approach to uh, trying to contain virus at that time. But that's really challenging for me to expound upon at this point, because we've got a ways to go to get there, and we don't know what's around the corner. Well, thank you for expounding this much. I appreciate it. Lexi, VPR. Hi. Um, a couple questions. First, about hospitalizations. Um, you know, the slide showed available hospital beds remain at some of the lowest we've seen throughout the pandemic. And then, you know, those skilled nursing facilities that hospitals rely on for discharging patients are, are dealing with a lot of their own outbreaks. Um, so is there anything the administration can do to help hospitals and healthcare workers get through the, the next few weeks as, um, as, you know, hospitals are still in a really tough place right now? Yeah, and we've been doing that uh, all along uh, throughout the pandemic and especially over the last few weeks. But I'll let uh, Secretary Samuelson expand upon that. Lexi, thank you for your question. Um, what we have seen is that there are a number of um, long-term care facilities that we've made investments into in order to ensure that there are adequate beds and we continue to monitor um, the ability for those long-term care facilities to stay open and we still are seeing um, additional subacute beds available. In addition to that, for our hospitals and our long-term care facilities and some of our other facilities such as our um, our mental health um, organizations supporting the Department of Children and Families, we're using a contract that we have with TLC, which is a staffing company, to deploy staff members into those organizations. Right now we've got over 104 staff members um, deployed across the spectrum of long-term care um, hospitals and um, some of our DCF facilities. In addition to that, a few months ago, uh, we put in an app, or two months ago, we put in an application and received staff from FEMA. Those staff came in from FEMA to serve three hospitals. They still are serving two of them. That helps to reduce the strain on the nursing staff. And more recently, in the last week, we have uh, worked with our National Guard, recognizing that it's not just clinical staff, but it's um, staff that are working uh, uh, in our food service, in environmental services, doing phlebotomy, in our healthcare facilities, um, particularly our hospitals. We've been able to, as they've stepped forward every single time we've asked, use the National Guard um, to come into our hospitals and organizations to help support them um, to alleviate some of the strain from the staffing. What I heard from the Vermont Hospital Association and others earlier this week is they are experiencing strain. But uh, at the current levels and current numbers, we, they feel confident um, that, we're, that they can continue to sustain the level of care that they're operating in, particularly with these additional resources that have been added. Did you get everything, Lexi? Oh, just one or uh, two more questions, actually. I wanted to clarify something about the tests at home policy. You know, we heard reports of schools running out of tests in the first few days um, of that change. So right now, do schools have enough rapid tests to follow the current guidance? And is the supply healthy enough to keep this policy going? Secretary French. Uh, sort of the uh, longer view, yeah, we feel confident the supply is adequate. Uh, there are schools right now who are looking for tests, um, and that's something, you know, it's very dynamic right now. We have uh, orders coming in all the time and the supplies going out all the time. And as I mentioned, we have a statewide conference call this afternoon to kind of review some of those mechanics. So it is, uh, it's a very challenging moment in a lot of ways, but people are really rising the occasion, doing the work at all levels. And 
I have one more quick question for Dr. Levine, which is just to clarify, is the state looking to expand wastewater surveillance of um, COVID uh, beyond Burlington? <clears throat> the answer is it actually already is beyond Burlington in a few select uh, locations, but yes, there's a federal initiative that uh, is looking as we speak to expand across the country and uh, they're particularly looking at communities that are uh, diverse communities that may have uh, more health care needs, um, have more of a uh, vulnerability index that's higher. So we'll be participating in that to try to ensure there are more Vermont communities in that list. Thank you. And maybe just to get back to the, uh, the test supplies, um, we still are concerned, obviously, about the uh, number. We have a lot on order. Uh, we want to make sure that they get delivered. Uh, we've been hampered a bit uh, by the federal government having their allotment uh, be satisfied. Uh, but um, the folks at uh, the Agency of Human Services are working diligently, as well as the uh, Emergency Operations Center and many of uh, across the state government are working the phones. I've worked the phones myself calling CEOs of some of these suppliers to make sure that we get what we uh, we think we're supposed to get. So, again, this has been an all hands on deck approach, and uh, so far so good. But uh, we still are a bit concerned about the supply. But uh, right now, today, we're in we're in good shape. And we just want to make sure that we have those next week and the week after. All right, we'll move to. Michael, True North Reports. Mike, True North Reports. All right. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next Tuesday.